welcome this is advanced reaction engineering course now in this in this course we cover a lot of ground general applications of chemical reaction engineering to our requirements in chemical process industry and as well as in daily life and so on. So, what I would like to do in this uh, session is just give you an overall perspective of what I want to do in this uh, lecture series of uh, uh, maybe 30 40 hours. Okay. So, let me just run through one by one just give you a feel for uh, what is uh, uh, contained in each of these modules. Okay. So, let me get a beginning. So, we have we begin with an introduction I mean uh, the, the object here is to try and uh, bring uh, to your attention what, uh, uh, what we will do in this course of course and then what is the methodology that we will follow and uh, you know how we plan to address various issues and how we will uh, explain the principles through various examples and so on. So, the, the methodology uh, we will try to adopt here is uh, one of problem solving. So, that we uh, learn how to derive the equations that, uh, that describe a certain process and uh, or certain uh, uh, idealizations that we will look at and, and also show how it applies to different situations. Okay. So, that is the, uh, uh, the way we will uh, go around in this uh, course. And, uh, if you, I am sure all of you are familiar, but see we will look at what I see as design equations, equation for ideal reactors. Okay. Now, I mean, I mean in the sense that you know we have a reaction equipment and uh, that reaction equipment uh, uh, in which a certain reaction takes place let us say A goes to B or A goes to B plus C whatever. So, uh, what we need to know is you know how this particular material that is entering a uh, rea reaction vessel, how it will undergo reaction, to what extent it will undergo reaction, what are the parameters that will determine uh, the extent to which the reaction would occur. And, uh, most importantly what is the size of the equipment that is required for a certain extent of reaction of course, our interest. And in some cases you know we are not looking at uh, simply uh, continuous operation we are looking at batch operations in which case our interest is to find out what is the time that is required for a given extent of reaction and so on. And there are situations in which we are neither doing continuous nor doing batch, we are doing something like semi continuous, semi batch operations. In which case, you know, our interest is to really understand how the, uh, the process can be uh, written down in terms of mathematics, so that we can tell what might happen to the process and uh, how we can intervene in a way, so that the process can be made to move in the direction of our interest. Okay. So, the design equations for ideal reactors is essentially a way of trying to, uh, to idealize what might be happening and so that our equations are able to, to approximate uh, what might happen in real life. Just as an example, I mean more of it you will see when you actually look at these. Just to put it in the perspective, let us say you have uh, an equipment like this. Okay and in which uh, you know this uh, reaction is occurring a uh, flow is coming in and flow is going out. Okay. So, this has got a certain volume B a reaction A uh, goes to B or let us say A or, so or A plus B going to C plus D. Okay. Now, you will recognize that A, B, C, D you know A can be a gas B can be a liquid you know it can be it can be same phases may be the same phases may be different products may have uh, some of it may be a gas some of it you know there are various kinds of situations that are likely. So, for each of these situations you know our equations must be able to appropriately take into account. So, we will look at simple situations as we go along we will modify and then take into account uh, you know more variations that might occur in real life. Okay. So, the design equations if we are looking at design equations. 
the object of design equation is to put down in simple terms how inputs and outputs or inputs uh, uh, in the initial and final can be related uh, in terms of uh, parameters that you and I understand, recognize and so on. In the uh, chemical engineering literature or chemical process industry, frequently we see what we, see, what we call as tubular reactors. Okay. Now, tubular reactors are essentially pipes of various sizes and typically they contain a catalyst okay, uh, which is feed is coming in and going out. Okay. Tubular reactors are common in the industry because they are easy to build and then uh, you know the flow fields can be easily understood, can be measured, a lot of techniques have been evolved over a number of years to understand the fluid mechanics and therefore, it is it's a common device which is employed in the industry. Okay. So, often we talk about plug flow in our uh, tubular reactor designs equations. By plug flow, I mean in the sense that the reason why we sort of idealize situations like this is that they are easier to treat and therefore, we are able to get equations that is able to quickly uh, idealize uh, what might, uh, might be otherwise uh, difficult to understand and predict. So, we have a first principle understanding of what might happen. By plug flow, what is meant is that if you have a fluid element here, it sort of gets in, it sort of moves through the equipment, it moves through the equipment and emerges. And there is another fluid element which comes and moves through the equipment and emerges. In other words, what we are saying is that if we recognize or idealize a flow through an equipment as plug flow, it only means that these fluid elements pass without recognizing the existence of other fluid elements. Therefore, the time of residence of these fluid elements can be very, very uh, precisely uh, calculated and therefore, we are able to tell how long they have spent in the equipment and therefore, we can tell what is the extent to which the reaction may have taken place based on the numbers that we have in our hand. So, plug flow is uh, an idealized version of uh, the reaction equipment that you will see in the process industry often called as tubular reactors. So, we will set up equations as we go along to describe what is called as plug flow reactors. Little earlier, little earlier we said we talked about stirred vessels, these are all stirred vessels. Okay. Now, stirred vessels cells can be a batch equipment or can be a continuous equipment continuous okay, equipment. Now, batch equipment means that you know there is a flow inside, but there is no flow out in the sense it is batch, there is no flow in. So, you start with a certain amount of fluid here and you process that fluid for a certain length of time and we set up equations that would describe uh, what might be going on inside the equipment. In other words, there is no inflow, there is no outflow. Therefore, whatever happens in the reaction uh, is like it is sort of it is accounted for by the, the process or the reaction kinetics that is responsible for that reaction for that reaction to take place. So, batch you will find batch equipments are, are generally quite common in small scale industry if you go to paint industry, if you go to pharmaceutical industry or uh, oil industry and various kinds of industries uh, where you know you want to process them in small scale because the, the, the scale of operations are such that the demand is such that it only is amenable to small scales of operation or in places like pharmaceutical industry where uh, purities and then quality etcetera are so stringent that you must be able to keep track of uh, in which batch it was produced. So, that in case you want to recall the product at a later stage, it might be possible to actually uh, inform the, uh, the dealers to recall that product in case it is found to be unsatisfactory for whatever reasons. So, pharmaceutical industry batch, uh, batch processes are quite common. Okay. Now, so a batch equipment is essentially a, a vessel which has got you know there is provision for inlet outlet, there is provision for entering inside and cleaning and so on. So, it is quite common of various sizes may be 10, 20. 5 to 10 kiloliters is typically the sizes you will see in the industry. There is something called CSTR which is quite common in chemical engineering literature which is called continuous continuous stirred tank reactor which is it is an equipment like this where there is continuous input and there is a continuous output these valves are these are the valves. So, these are open so, so that there is continuous flow and continuous output. In other words 
what you are seeing here is that chemical reaction takes place as the flow comes in and goes out. And since many of these reactions could be quite uh, you know exothermic, there are coils which might be which might be carrying a cooling or heating fluid so as to ensure that the reaction conditions are able to be achieved because of this uh, heating or cooling medium. So, the continuous stir tank reactor is one very common device that you might see in laboratories, in the universities and research labs and in the industry where the scales of operations are relatively larger, not very large relatively larger. Now, continuous uh, stir tank reactors uh, in the process industry the most common uh, we might see in uh, places for example, uh, you will find that uh, in um, uh, polymer industry where you have to deal with very viscous situations you will find that uh, uh, stir, stir tank provides you a good amount of mixing and so on. So, that the heat transfer can be satisfactory. So, you will find continuous reaction equipment in polymer industry. Okay. There are several other situations where continuous reaction equipments are quite common because of the fact that it permits you to continuously input and output at the same time ensure that the temperatures and process conditions are kept uniform. So, CSTR and batch are the stirred equipment that you will see in the process industry and the tubular reactors or plug flow devices that we call is quite common in the very large scale petroleum and other industries. Okay. So, for both these for both these situations there are design equations which we call as ideal reactors. So, what is meant by ideal reactors by ideal we mean that the conditions in different parts of the equipment in terms of temperature, pressure, uh, concentrations are uniform. Or in other words, the fluid as soon as it enters, it is able to get itself mixed thoroughly, so that the conditions inside the equipment is same as conditions that is leaving the equipment. That is what is called as a continuous stir tank reactor, very popular in the chemical engineering literature. So, when we, look, when we said design equations for ideal reactors, we will be looking at these two situations and set up equations that will describe how reactions take place in these two, uh, how reactions can be understood as they take place in these two kinds of equipments. Now, we find in our, in our experience in process industry that a reaction does not go to completion for whatever reasons. Let us just give an example. Let us say you have a reaction equipment, feed is coming in, feed is going out. Now, we find that this is the reactor. So, this is what is called as the plug flow plug flow recycle reactor. Okay. Now, when would you engage a, a process of this nature? We would engage process of this nature when we find that the, the products that come out of this reaction requires to be recycled there would be situations that you will learn as you go along are situations in which the products have to be recycled. They have to be recycled because you find that the products are able to uh, facilitate uh, the rate at which the reaction occurs this could be one reason or the products contain a lot of energy like heat for example, it is a very high temperature. So, you got to make use of that energy for your process that could be another example. Okay. So, there could be several situations of course, another example could be that uh, you know the, the reaction has not gone to completion therefore, you want to put a separator somewhere here and then separate the products and then uh, recycle the unreacted products. So, there are various situations that you will encounter where recycle is required. Now, when recycle is required we need to set up our design equations which will take into account the effect of recycle the effect of the recycle on the size of the equipment number 1, effect of recycle on the extent of reaction, the various issues that we must consider when we put a provide a recycle. Okay. It can be steady state, it can be unsteady state because you know you might be encountering situations in which you also want to understand how long it takes for a certain process to reach steady state 
or you are interested in the unsteady state part of the process because you are starting up the process and you want to know how long it has taken to reach steady state. Various issues that might come up in a, in, in a, in a process that we would like to understand and then set up our mathematics so that we can actually tell how long it will be before the steady state is achieved. So, we need situations like this in uh, process industry. So, we will set up equations that uh, takes into account the effects of uh, uh, recycle uh, so that we can uh, set up our equations appropriately. Okay, having said this, we want to look at plug flow recycle reactors. Some illustrations, illustrative examples. Now, what we will, uh, when I say um, plug flow illustrative examples, uh, what I like to, uh, to br bring to your attention to in such uh, uh, lectures is that, we, I mean, what are the physical situations where you might want to do a recycle, and uh, how would that recycle uh, benefit you in a in a process? Let us take an example. Say, for example, A going to B, let us say as an example, where the reaction, the reaction is autocatalytic, is autocatalytic. What is meant by autocatalytic? Autocatalytic, we mean that the reaction rate at which this reaction occurs is dependent on A, it is also dependent on B. Now, when a reaction is autocatalytic, which means that the rate at which the reaction moves really depends upon how much of product has been put into the system. So, clearly speaking, unless you put product appropriately, the reaction does not move. Now, if you look at the recycle, the recycle, this recycle device provides a way by which you can put products back into the feed. So, Autocatalytic reaction is a good example where recycle becomes very, very important for the process to move forward. So, autocatalytic reactions require recycle and uh, very clearly it will, there might be an optimum recycle at which you must operate and so on, which is important from the point of your process optimization. All those features will have to be appropriately taken into account into our design equations plus it has to be appropriately explained, it has to be appropriately explained when we look at illustrative examples. Now, I mean if you look at uh, real life for example, what are the real life situations where we have to deal with autocatalytic reactions? The finest example you will think of are biological reactions. Say for example, you have let us say you have you have a reaction, I am just giving a small example, you have um, C 6. H 12 O 6, this is glucose, it is reacting with some cells, let us say Saccharomyces, Saccharomyces cerevisiae. This is a fungi, it is a fungi which feeds on glucose under certain conditions of pH and temperature and oxygen tension and so on, gives you alcohol, it gives you alcohol and carbon dioxide. Okay. Now, you can see here is 3 C 2 H 5 O H and C O 2, you can balance this, how many carbon is there, you can balance this anyway, it is not so critical right now. Okay. So, you have glucose giving you alcohol and uh, water, okay. alcohol and carbon dioxide. Now, this particular reactions you will find that if unless you put in saccharomyces and get the appropriate conditions, you will not be able to produce alcohol. So, what is being said is that so, the presence of saccharomyces makes this reaction happen. In that process, more cells are formed. Okay. So, in principle, in principle, these cells can be harvested and then put back into the process. Okay. That is one way. Or alternatively, alternatively, you find that as more and more cells uh, are formed, it is able to catalyze the reaction in the forward direction. So, autocatalytic is a good example in which you will find that the, the addition of the product which uh, uh, cells are a product uh, to enhances the rate of forward reaction. Just look at uh, some more examples of, uh, uh, of recycled reactors. Now, there is another situation that you would have seen in real life and some of you may have seen is uh, if you go to a waste treatment plant. See if you I mean all over the world you will find that 
uh, we produce a lot of let us say sewage which comes out of uh, uh, human settlements. Okay. There could be uh, waste coming from dairy something which contains lot of waste material. So, typically what is done is that these materials is taken into a into a, a into a basin in which uh, you know you put in um, oxygen you put in oxygen uh, by aeration okay and then presence in the presence of oxygen and the sewage which contains organics like carbohydrates and things like that the cells which is present in that environment grows and as a result you'll find that the waste material gets consumed and then the water that comes out is relatively uh, clean or this is called as waste treatment this is called waste treatment okay now you'll find you'll find that that sewage let us say sewage contains carbohydrate so you are putting oxygen okay so this gets oxidized so it becomes carbon dioxide and water and the cells that are present in the water produce more cells okay so this is another example this is another example where the 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 whole reaction goes forward only if there are cells and the cells produce more cells and the effect of these cells is to further enhance the reaction. In other words, this is another very good ex I mean example of autocatalytic reactions. Okay. Now, whether you use devices, we can use various types of devices, we can use devices which is called stirred tanks, which uh, is called these are all stirred tanks. Okay. We can use stirred tanks as devices for doing this process or you can do recycle devices like what I have said. In both cases, the principles are that the product which is cell enhances the rate at which the reaction occurs. Okay. This is what we are trying to say. So, plug flow recycle devices or recycles in general are very common uh, in process industry and uh, we need equations to take care of how to deal with recycles in real life and that is what we will do in these kinds of lectures. Now, we often find if I mean I mean it is not very unusual that in chemical process there are many many reactions that occur there are many many reactions that occur and we have to deal with what is called as multiple reaction multiple multiple reactions. I mean what do you mean by multiple reactions? What we want to say here is that Suppose, let us say I am just as an example, I write uh, A plus B going to C plus D, this is a single reaction. Okay. Now, if I want to talk about a multiple reaction, I can write the multiple reaction like this A 1 alpha 1 1 A 1 plus alpha 1 2 A 2 up to say alpha 1 N A N. Similarly, alpha P 1 A 1 plus alpha P 2 A 2 up to alpha p n a n equal to 0. What is being said here is that you have written a plus b equal to c plus d as a reaction. This can also be written as c plus d minus of a minus of b equal to 0. I mean it is what is being said is that if you have a chemical reaction, it can write it as an algebraic equation. It is convenient. Okay. Or if you have many, many reactions occurring as I have said here alpha 1 1 a 1 to alpha 1 and a n as this is one reaction there are p such reactions. So, react there are p reactions here. Now, the important point is when there are large number of reactions are happening. So, we also like to know I mean how to manage how to understand when the large number of reactions. Okay. Now, therefore, we need a systematic procedure by which we are able to deal with very large number of reactions. So, that we can account for them, we can find out what is uh, what is happening in the reactions and so on. So, there is a general technique which is uh, used to understand how many reactions are independent. You know, independence of reactions is an idea which uh, has come in because of the fact that there are many, many reactions are happening. Okay. Once we recognize what is called the independence of reactions, we can also understand that if there are many, many reactions occurring, how many of them are independent, how many of them are dependent and so on. Just to illustrate this, let me just illustrate this what I am saying. Say for example, you have a reaction A going to B and the reaction B going to A. What is meant by this? We are saying that this reaction A to B is and this is actually a reversible reaction. That means, reaction go, go in the forward direction, it can go in the reverse direction. 
So, which means when when we are when we are conducting a reaction A going to B in principle in principle perhaps both the rate processes are occurring. Okay, both the rate processes are occurring. What we see is that the reaction seems to go from A to B because one rate process is faster than the other. Therefore, the net in the net you see that the reaction is going for in one direction. And there are techniques I mean you would have learnt uh, or you will learn as you go along by which you can actually measure the rate process in both directions. There are techniques available and there are methods available you will learn all these as you go along. Therefore, in principle all these are possible to be measured. So, but the fact of interest to us is that if there are there is A going to B and B going to A how many of these reactions are independent is a question that we frequently will ask ourselves. Now, it is common sense by looking at it we can say that you know if you just take one sample of suppose let us say reaction is occurring in an equipment like this A going to B, B going to C. If you just take a sample of A, A and of, of this of this material and analyze for A, okay. if you analyze for A start with N A 0 as the total moles and then we determine what is the moles at any other time. So, once you know this difference once you know this difference you can tell what is the amount of B that has been formed because that is coming from stoichiometry. In other words what we are trying to say is that if you know the independence of reactions you can tell what is the composition of the system. So, what is uh, what is generally uh, suggested in uh, multiple or uh, in what is called as reaction networks is that we determine we determine the number of independent reactions we just determine number of independent reactions. Okay. Once we know the number of independent reactions we can we can tell the composition of the system fully because uh, that is what will determine the composition of the system. And as you go along we will use these general methods to deal with uh, uh, multiple reactions and uh, you will find as you go along particularly in biology when huge number of reactions are occurring you will find it extremely useful to deal with uh, use these techniques because it makes it very convenient and uh, there are computational methods available so by which we can deal with them very effectively. Now, having said this having said this uh, let me sort of uh, draw attention to some very very interesting situations that we might encounter one situation which we will uh, is uh, multiple reactions multiple reactions in soil environment. Okay. Now, as you all know that uh, just give you a small example just to just put this in the context. Suppose, you have a reaction let us say N O 2 minus giving you N H 4 plus. So, N O 2 minus giving you N O 3 minus. So, N O 2 minus reacting with N H 4 plus gives you N 2 plus H 2 O. Okay. 1, 2, 3 and then we could also have a situation that N H 4 plus uh, which is formed in reaction 1 goes for cell synthesis. How does it happen? Uh, this ammonium nitrogen is actually incorporated into cells due to various reactions that happen in the soil environment. Of course, you could also have a situation that the carbohydrates uh, gets oxidized to give you carbon dioxide and water uh, plus energy. So, the, the context here is something like this I mean this uh, in this planet we produce close to about 2 billion tons of grains to feed the population of the world okay. and all this comes from about 1300 uh, million hectares of uh, cultivated land in different parts of the world India included and the cultivated land in India is uh, uh, something like uh, out of uh, total land area of uh, about about 180 uh, or 200 million hectares is the total cropped area in this country. So, in the sense that uh, if you want to understand uh, what is happening in soil environment we can understand this by looking at these 5 reactions. 
Okay. Now, we can do experiments uh, to find out what happens to NO2 minus, NO3 minus, NH4 plus and then uh, carbohydrate can be measured appropriately. Or in other words, we can we can do a small experiment to find out how the the these uh, these uh, nutrients NO2 minus NO3 minus NH4 plus and then carbohydrate is actually channeled into various pathways through simple experiments. Okay, now you notice here this is what this if I call this as reaction one and call this reaction two call this as reaction three call this as reaction four call this as reaction five. Essentially, what we're trying to say here is that here are just five reactions. And these five reactions are able to tell us how uh, you are producing uh, uh, various cells. It can be food crops are uh, in around the world. So, through some simple experiments, I mean, and the kind of power that these experiments have on is is, no, is enormous. As you can see, you can do these experiments and find out how the nitrogen that we add uh, that we add to soil and how they are related to the production of uh, food crops and how the carbohydrate that might be present in the soil environment is used for the production of food crops. You see, these kinds of interlinkages we can understand by doing some simple experiments and in multiple reactions using a soil environment in, in a laboratory. It, you do not have to go into the field and you will find that you are able to get results which are able to explain what happens in different parts of the world, giving you a feel for how fairly simple experiments done in a laboratory which does not cost you a lot, uh, it gives you an insight into very, very, very complex uh, happenings in agriculture, plantations, uh, plantation crops in the world and so on. Okay. So, that is the power of trying to understand multiple reactions in soil of which we will look at some examples to illustrate how we can get insights into fairly complicated situations using fairly simple techniques. So, next we will try to look at is what we call as catalyst deactivation. Now, uh, the context to looking at uh, catalyst deactivation is that uh, if you look at, at our process industry, our process industry many of them, many of them require catalysts, catalysts for the reactions to, to, uh, to take place. I mean we know of ammonia synthesis of which Haber won a Nobel prize in 1915 for the development and on for the discovery of the synthesis catalyst. Of course, a lot of improvements have come since then and there are in fact, uh, catalyst is, is, is the center of uh, of uh, many, many important processes which make life uh, so easy for us today compared to what it was maybe 100 years ago. So, but catalysts undergo deactivation. Okay. Uh, fundamentals of deactivation is, is, is a chemistry that we must know so that we can prevent it, we can improve upon it and so on. But from the point of view of uh, chemical engineers who run processes, what is important is that we would like to know what is the kinetics of catalyst deactivation. You know, at, at what rate they can they deactivate, so that we have some way for understanding how long our catalyst will last in the process environment, so that we can replace them. Alternatively, we can regenerate them appropriately. So, the whole process of catalyst deactivation uh, you know, requires you to find out methods by which we can understand the kinetics of deactivation. Kinetics. So, we must know the kinetics of deactivation. I mean for which we must do measurements and even if you do measurements you see what is important is that we must know how to use those measurements to derive and to get the kinetic information of our interest. So, what is important in catalyst deactivation is to be able to develop our mathematics uh, to represent what is going on in the process so that we can get the information of our interest. So, in these lectures on catalyst deactivation what we will try to emphasize and give you methods is to how do we conduct our experiments, so that we can get data in a form that we can use to extract the deactivation kinetics from our experiments. So, this is what is the, is the content of the catalyst deactivation that we will do in these uh, lectures. Okay. Now, if you know if I, if I say that catalyst deactivation kinetics is given by an equation of this form, equation of this form. Okay some function of uh, concentrations and so on. So, our, our important thing is to recognize is to recognize that uh, that that what is the value of m, what is this function 
uh, which is depends which determines the deactivation kinetics. So, that when we write the rate at which the catalyst deactivates by this function, we are able to convert this uh, and appropriately integrate this into our design in the reactor design. So, that we are able to understand how this process under catalyst deactivation will run. So, that we can appropriately tune the process to take care of this deactivation and ensure that we produce product products at the rate at which we design we have designed that plant for. So, the, the object of this particular this set of lectures is to determine this function. So, that we are able to go forward and use this information for our design operation and control of processes involving catalysts. Now, there is a related issue which we must bear in mind. So, what I call here as process evaluation process evaluation under catalyst deactivation. Now, what we would try to learn here is that say let us for example, let us say let us say we have a we have a reactor okay. and then let us say it goes through a separator products come out. Okay, and then the unreacted goes back. And this is this is the most common that we will see in the process industry. This is a reactor. There's a separator. All right. Now, if I call this as F A zero, if I call this as F A go, let's say A goes to B as an example. Now, what what we will see in a process is that as this catalyst, there is a catalyst here. There is a catalyst here catalyst which deactivates this is deactivates. So, what you would expect as this deactivates the amount of product that you will produce here will keep on decreasing and clearly which means the amount of product that formed here is decreasing and therefore, what you are going to get here is also will decrease. Now, this separator has been designed to process a certain amount of the product. Now, as this keeps decreasing you will find that this material this separator is not working to your design. So, it is suboptimal and therefore, your process is not satisfactory. Now, clearly when you design this reaction equipment we have to anticipate what is the deactivation we have to anticipate we have to anticipate the effects of this deactivation A is the activity and appropriately design your process okay, which means you would have which means that if your rate at which component A that is formed let us say this is some this is the activity which is changing some other function C. So, this effect this effect you should account for in the design. So, that with time with time as this catalyst activity keeps on decreasing there might be must be a process tuning that you will do or process adjustments that you will do which will ensure that the catalyst even though if it deactivates the product that comes out here does not change with time. Okay. So, that in other words there are strategies by which we can run processes despite the fact that there is deactivation and it is these strategies that we will learn in these lectures okay. and we will illustrate these through examples where you can actually I mean use these principles to uh, to understand how we can run these processes. We pointed out that commercial processes like deactivating catalysts we need to continuously adjust the process conditions. So, that the quantity of material that is produced here per unit time etcetera is uh, invariant with time. So, that we are able to produce these products. Okay. So, essentially these are all uh, time dependent kind of operations. Okay. So, time dependent time dependent operations we just now pointed out that uh, catalyst deactivation is an example of time dependent operation. And we also said that uh, there are strategies by which we can manage the time dependent operations by appropriate adjustment of the process conditions. So, that the the output does not see a time dependence you see 
these are the kinds. Now, there, there is another set of in situations in real life where actually there is time dependence. That means, we accept the fact that there is time dependence and we want to be able to understand those time dependence uh, mathematically, so that we can set up our equations. We have all the numbers in front of us. Therefore, you know how the time dependence actually happens, how we, we, we take that into account in our. So, time dependent operations are one, you have a batch process, a batch process. What is the batch process? You have a reaction happening here okay? and then you have put in at 0 time at time t equal to 0, you have started with some compost C A naught and C B naught and so on and your product A plus B goes to C plus D. Therefore, this tells you how long you must run this process so that you can get your products. So, that is one in, in fairly elementary example of time dependent operation. There is a more involved time dependent operation is that you have let us say a, a reactor okay, which is uh, producing a product. Okay, okay. Now, this particular reactor we have to uh, there is a start up the start up of this. So, start up what is meant by start up? You have a reaction uh, you have a reactor which you want starting now and you want to know how long it takes to reach steady state and so on. Therefore, this during the start up up to reaching steady state there is some time gap involved. What is the timeline and how do we understand that timeline and how do we ensure that during the process of starting up to the point it reaches steady state everything is very safe nothing goes out of control. So, start up of a plant start up of a reactor is an issue which is time dependent. So, the effects of time must be appropriately accounted and appropriately incorporated in the in the mathematics, so that we know how the uh, the uh, the evolution of the of the uh, of the composition of the system is dependent on system parameters, etcetera. Okay, so time dependence startup is a very good example of time dependent operations. And for that matter, all startups, you know, it's not, not just chemical reactor alone. You'll find that any startup that you have, uh, you have to deal with you will have to deal with time dependence and therefore, your mathematics should take into account all the concerns that will that will uh, that will determine the time dependence of your process. Uh, let us let us just take uh, uh, an example to illustrate what I am saying. See what happens? Suppose you have a CSTR, see you have a reaction taking place, a reaction is taking place. Now, I mean this, this is an example, it does not mean that it happens in daily life or in industry, but, but it is something that helps us to understand how mathematics can help us to get a feel for what happens and mathematics can help us to tell how we can prevent many of the difficulties we might typically face if you do not formulate your problem in mathematical terms. Okay. For example, this is an instance of a stirred tank, it is called CSTR. Okay. Now, we start the CSTR with an initial condition C A i, this is the initial condition C i equal to some value. I okay. will call this C A i equal to um, some, 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 some value C A naught. Now, you will realize by, uh, by formulating the mathematics that if you choose this C A i appropriately carefully, then the start up, the start up time what is meant by startup time? The time that is required for the process to reach steady state. Startup time is the time that is required, time required to reach steady state. Reach steady state. Okay. Now, if this time required to reach steady state is very large, you see, then clearly you see you are not the, the process is not doing anything useful for you, and then whatever you produce is unsatisfactory, it has to be recycled anyway. So, it is a, it's a, it's a, it's a cost that you are unnecessarily incurring. So, if you can keep this time very small, it is very advantageous and your mathematics will tell you how to do it. So, these are the advantages of being able to formulate your problem mathematically, because lot of the answers 
that you would learn through experiment, uh, th through trial and error, it will come to you without having to go through those trial and error and save time, save cost plus huge insight into what is going on in the process. You see that is that is something that uh, it gives you a great confidence of how to deal with otherwise difficult situations. And this confidence is what makes it important in running processes, designing processes, managing crisis, managing safety issues and so on. So, this is the important part that we will uh, try to illustrate through an example to say how startup and how the initial state that you can choose so that we can keep the startup time as small as possible. Now, what we have tried to do uh, in the uh, in these uh, lectures of uh, seven eight lectures is to set up uh, the basic uh, basic uh, uh, foundations of for uh, dealing with chemical reactions and then uh, setting up the equation that are required to explain what is going on. See, we have so far uh, talked about uh, situations where the system has been assumed to be at a constant temperature. That means, we have really not accounted for effects of temperature in the process. Now, I mean I am sure you all recognize this that a chemical reaction typically releases heat or requires heat. So, adding heat or removing heat, uh, heat are uh, two important uh, situations that we all have to uh, account for. Okay. So, adding and removing heat is crucial to uh, uh, to managing chemical reactions. I am just give a small example, I mean it is not that you know about. Suppose, you are looking at a power plant in which you are burning coal to make steam as an example. I mean coal combustion is a very well studied chemical reaction, releases a huge amount of energy which we use to make steam and then the steam is used for turning turbines and making electricity and so on. Now, the important thing is that the, the rate at which the coal is burning Okay. And the rate at which the steam uh, water the going through the tube is able to pick up that heat and then convert it into steam, you have to match the two correct. So, the rate of combustion must be equal to the rate of uh, rate of uh, production of steam. So, that design these are the kinds of design features that we have to look into when we are looking at chemical reactions. So, energy balance. So, what we are saying now is that energy balance, energy balance is crucial for reactor design it is crucial to reactor design, which means we must take into account whatever energy is going into the process, whatever energy is coming out of the process okay. and uh, the energy that we are putting into the process might be in the form of internal energy, while the energy that is coming out of the process might be in the form of sensible heat. So, we have to see how the energy of, uh, of uh, internal energy or enthalpy as we call say is actually used in the process. And therefore, we have to see how heat is generated because of chemical reaction, how heat coming out of the chemical reaction can be uh, appropriately channeled into the process and so on. So, energy balance is uh, crucial to understanding how reactions will take place. So, our reactor design actually requires not just understanding of material balances of which we have talked about so far but requires an understanding of how material and energy balance are connected are related. So, we have to write the energy balance and see how material balance and energy balance are related and deal with both material and energy balance together in the design of reactors involving heat effects. And these are instances where there are huge chemical energies that is released because of reactions or required to conduct the reaction. In both cases, we have to transfer heat through an appropriate uh, uh, device in the reaction equipment. Okay. So, energy balance is crucial to our process. Now, energy balance can be in stirred vessels. Okay. Now, stirred vessels, we pointed out we had a stirred vessel like this okay. and we said we have a coil into which uh, putting a cooling or a heating fluid. Okay. Now, this coil instead of putting a coil we might put a jacket okay. I see that is also as good as through which you can circulate a fluid and then take out the fluid. Okay. So, there could be various ways by which we can put energy in and uh, take energy out. Okay. And, but important point is that your equation your mathematical description must appropriately account for energy going in so that we energy going in, in in which form it is going in. And then it typically goes in in the form of uh, enthalpy 
okay, of energy that comes out may be of the form of sensible heat and so on. So, we have to appropriately take that into account. So, that if there is huge amount of heat release appropriately it can be uh, removed through uh, devices that we can design and incorporate into the system. So, energy balance stirred vessels, energy balance for plug flow vessels, okay, plug flow vessels. So, let us just appreciate uh, how uh, when there is a stirred vessel the removal of energy uh, is relatively simple because of the fact that it is stirred and therefore, heat transfer coefficients are quite satisfactory we are able to remove the heat or add heat more effectively. When it is a plug flow vessel in the sense that we have a vessel like this when the flow inside uh, is uh, a gas or a liquid so they have to be removed only through uh, an external heat exchange and here the situations are far more involved and uh, the designs have to be proper and in more importantly our equations must adequately represent how these exchanges occur and uh, what are the heat transfer coefficients involved and so on which we will take into account when we write our energy balance. We will explain more of the things as we go along. Thank you.